First of all, I've been retired since 2003. Mm -hmm. So most of the role that I, the actor role I played has been between 1989 and 2003 mm -hmm. at the National Science Foundation with a slight addendum because I served on the board of the Internet Co uh, Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, from 2006 to 2009. Mm -hmm. And I keep looking at the camera instead of you, but that's just okay. that's habit. Um, so at the National Science Foundation, my job uh, in the elevator speech, my job was to connect the internet or bring internet around the world. Um, to expand on that, when I came to the National Science Foundation in 1989, the NSFNet had established itself pretty much as the center of gravity of the internet. And some people wanted to say it was the core of the internet, but that's a technical term. And it really wasn't because the internet was a network of networks, so it was no longer a core, but it was a center of gravity. Everybody wanted to connect to the National Science Foundation uh, network. And my job, or my mission that I assumed for myself, was to help them do that. And so little by little, we connected a lot of countries, about 25 countries between about 1991 and 95 with the help of a project that I set up called the International Connections Manager, which was awarded to Sprint. And Sprint had no experience in the internet at that time. This was their way of jumping in. And they really bent over backwards to do everything possible to make things happen. So they were a great partner. But we connected, or well, we solidified existing connections with the Nordic countries, Nordjanet, and with France. That was the beginning of things. But along the line, we helped to connect uh, Russia and uh, China. And the very last connection before the project was ended was with Mongolia. And that was 95, 96. So there were many, oh, and, and Latin American countries along the way with the help of the Organization of American States, uh, Saul Han, my partner in crime there. Saul worked in country with the various governments and was able to uh, provide some money for equipment. Well, on the other hand, we worked uh, to help get the, the satellite links connected and get those satellite links connected to the NSFNet with the help of Sprint. So that was a big partnership. Then uh, Al Gore came along and started a G7 initiative called um, Global Interoperability of Broadband Networks, Gibbon. And the idea there was that broadband networks, and by that he meant 45 <clears throat> megabits per second, which today is not fast at all, but they were beginning to spring up and he wanted a way of interconnecting those networks from other countries. And um, so what we did in response to that was to kick off a project at University of Illinois Chicago with Tom DeFonte and Maxine Brown to set up a router in Chicago where countries could haul their links across the U.S. and connect to each other there. Now, I, I mentioned hauling across the U.S. If we had set this thing up in Los Angeles, that would have been great for the Asians, uh, Taiwan and you know, uh, Japan and so forth. But then the people from Europe wouldn't be too happy because they'd have to come clear across the U.S. If we set it up in New York, it would have been the same thing with the people from Asia not being too happy. So we set it up in Chicago when nobody was happy or everybody was equally unhappy. But it worked rather nicely and many countries connected to the StarTap. And the beauty of the StarTap was that everybody connected to a router. So for example, France, if they wanted to, could connect to Taiwan through that router without going through any intervening US um, infrastructure. So there was no US policy imposed. And that was one of the key features. And this, this went on to be replicated at interconnection points all over the world. So it was one of the first ones there. And that was uh, realized in 1997. And then uh, toward the latter part of the 1990s, uh, Greg Cole at University of Tennessee uh, got a cooperation going among Russia, China, and the United States to basically the, the concept was to set up a dedicated wavelength around the Northern Hemisphere to support computation, computationally intensive research. 
and this was called Gloriad, and Gloriad is still running today, although many other countries or networks have joined. So for example, Canada, the Nordic countries, Nordjernet, Surfnet in Holland, um, Singapore, India, um, Egypt, the most recent one, and I'm pretty sure I'm leaving somebody out, oh, Canada. <clears throat> and they're all uh, members of this Gloriad group. So Gloriad's architecture is now sort of a ring of rings around the northern hemisphere, but again, to support computationally intensive science like weather research and so forth. So that's a progression that's that sort of helped. And I was more an advisor to Gloriad uh, toward the end and still do so informally at times. Uh, one other thing that's important is that it was the grassroots networks. Uh, places in the underbelly of Asia, for example, or Africa, uh, that, uh, and even some, some in Latin America, which were just trying to start up. And uh, Randy Bush at the Network Startup Resource Center was our awardee for that. <clears throat> Later taken, uh, when Randy went on to other things, Steve Huter, now at uh, our uh, University of Oregon, runs the Network Startup Resource Center. And they do a lot of training of network operators. They leverage uh, funds from us and now from Google to get books and other materials to uh, start up networks around the world. And even a lot of used equipment. So for example, at some point when people would trade in uh, equipment to Cisco for bigger and more powerful stuff, uh, the rumor was, and I don't know how true this is, but the rumor was that Cisco actually bulldozed this stuff so that it wouldn't be used on the market because they wanted to then sell a more advanced. Well, um, stuff was saved from the bulldozer and actually shipped to a lot of these startup networks in different parts of the world. Again, the underbelly of Asia and Africa. And Steve Huter at the Network Startup Resource Center was responsible for that. So Steve continues to get funds from National Science Foundation and as I mentioned, a nice big grant from Google and uh, these things are ongoing. Well, a lot of the breakthroughs, you know, were technical and I didn't have a, a part in that. For example, you know, a huge breakthrough was the Border Gateway Protocol, which allowed <coughs> networks which would have had a lot of complication internally to avoid having to exchange all this detail by just having connections among these networks at border gateways. And border gateway protocol, I believe, uh, is still uh, working quite actively in the global internet. One of the problems is that, uh, let's see, the structure of networks is such that as you have a lot of very small, net, small, relatively small net, networks and you want to reach clients on them, the number of networks just explodes to the point that routing becomes uh, a very complicated matter. And uh, it would be difficult to have routers, at least in the, in the big boy commercial world, that were built on PCs as they used to be built back in the, in the 1980s and 1990s. And so I would, uh, as a layman in this, and I actually am a layman when it comes to this, I'd say that some of the routers are approaching, approaching supercomputer size of the 1990s, not maybe today's supercomputers, in order to be able to work. They're, they're amazing things. And uh, now because we've, pretty well run out of IP version 4 addresses, people are reselling blocks of addresses that they used to have and they're chopping them up. Well, that makes routing even more difficult. So the question is, will, to what extent will reachability of individual IP addresses be maintained? And I think that's even a problem today. It's only going to get worse. That would be a very simplistic characterization. The way, the way I'd, I'd talk about it is this. There are days which are sort of partly cloudy, partly sunny, but they say, well, but possible thunderstorms late this afternoon, some of which could be dangerous, could even spawn, spawn tornadoes. And uh, 
That's the way I'd sort of characterize it. Because <clears throat> the internet kind of bumbles along now. It's, it's held together sometimes with bailing wire and chewing gum. Because of all these routing problems, uh, because of links that go down and, have, and paths that have to be rediscovered and so forth, um, because of third and fourth tier networks that, that need to get uh, routed in, in the network, but have trouble getting peering relationship with the big boys. And um, <clears throat> then all of a sudden you've got, you got hacking incidents and uh, you know, troublemaking and so forth. So the thunderstorms come in, the lightning comes in. And then we learn that governments are really snooping on all the stuff that's going on. And so that casts big gray clouds over the whole thing. And uh, to what extent will the internet be able to persist as a global medium? Will, will the weight of all these things um, be supported by internet technology? And I don't know the answer for that one. Let's put it you know, this way. When the internet um, got started, it was largely an academic and research undertaking. And it was based on Unix. And there was really no real security built in other than things like passwords and uh, maybe some encryption here or there. And the attitude that my boss had at National Science Foundation was, that's not our concern. This is for the academics. People want to build in all kinds of security. That's somebody else's problem. Well, it's, I think that was a very valid point at that, at that time, but that was 1990. And um, security, how do you build security on a system which was never designed as a secure system? You know, that's the question. There are supposedly secure government networks in various countries. How secure they are <clears throat> and how they work, I don't know. I know they exist. Would, would uh, those security models be generalizable to the public? I don't know. My guess is no. Uh, will a whole new architecture have to be built to handle security? I'm not sure, but my guess is no matter what you build, Somebody's going to be able to hack into it. And um, no government or no big government is going to let people build networks that don't have back doors to them. Um, we, we learn in the headlines that you know, government is asking uh, internet access providers to build back doors into whatever they offer to the public. So that's very disturbing. Uh, I, I understand it from the point of view of government wanting to keep track of the bad guys. But for the casual or the everyday user, it's rather disturbing to know that his government and other governments can really figure out what he's doing and, and, and read his or her mail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the other concern that, that I have, and I have no idea where it's going, is the idea of um, consolidation and commercialization. So in the earlier days we had a lot of independent uh, internet service providers, ISPs, and gradually they were bought out as the industry consolidated. But the industry continued to consolidate and uh, gradually companies that at that point we said were totally clueless, like AT&T. AT&T was totally clueless when it came to internet in the 1990s. And every attempt we made to involve AT&T in the internet, they kind of turned their back and they, they weren't interested. So that's how MCI and Sprint, for example, got interested. Uh, but AT&T wasn't terribly interested. Now, of course, AT&T has undergone corporate changes and it merged with Bell South. Was it Bell South or Southern Bell? I, I'm not, I forget which. Um, so they're a different corporation now than they used to be. But here you have companies that are basically communications companies that uh, are now running large segments of the internet and um, I'm sure their, their philosophy is basically a philosophy of revenue and revenue generation for, for their shareholders and have very little sentiment for the internet the way we view the internet when it first got started. 
They're just looking at it as a way to, to, again, generate revenue for their shareholders by providing a service. Um, where they will go with that, I don't know. But I, I don't know to what extent the innovation which continues to evolve within the academic and research communities will be transferred to the commercial internet providers. Mm -hmm. Well, there's certainly a lot of developments, again, within the research community, mm -hmm. uh, especially things which are supporting what I call computen computationally intensive research. Now, will, to what extent those broadband things are going to be even useful to the average consumer, other than for entertainment purposes, you know, like watching streaming video, um, I'm not sure. So the, there, there is some exciting stuff, but um, I don't know to what extent it's going to imply. On the other hand, there are a lot of uh, useful things that are going on, applications and gadgets that go along with it, or um, Gadgets may be, not be the best word, but uh, what should we call them? Devices that go along. And, and I can give you an example of one that, that I find particularly useful, but it's just one. And he's searching into his pocket now for, ta-da! Uh, this, this belongs to me, but it's not my development. These are actually electrodes for an electrocardiograph. And this is just a phone, a case that fits on an iPhone. So it fits over an iPhone. And with this thing, I can take a lead one, I think it's lead one or lead two electrocardiogram, and turn it into a PDF and send it to a physician for interpretation by email. And that's just one example of mobile medical devices that, say, hook on to a smartphone. There are others, for example, uh, some people at MIT, I think, are on the verge of commercializing it, something that can be used in the third world where uh, they, they hook something to, to the iPhone and people do things to sort of match patterns, get patterns to converge. And from this, they can get a prescription for eyeglasses. And the next step is that that prescription can be sent over the network to somebody who can grind a pair of glasses and send them back to the user or to the, to the person. Uh, this could be useful in many parts of the United States and not just the third world. So those are just some of the things, devices which are using internet technology, which I think are bright points. That is so interesting. I've never... I'll never let you try it if you want. Sure. <laughs> that's really... Oh, that's so cool. I've yeah. heard a little bit about some of the... Yeah, well, actually, I'm, I'm developing a briefing to give to a group of senior citizens on mobile medical devices, so... Yeah, I mean, you've heard of Fitbits? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Fitbits, are, there are a lot of things like Fitbits. Nike has one. And, uh, these are just, you know, personal kinds of things. There's actually an application on the, on the uh, iPhone, but I'm sure uh, Android has it too, where you can put your finger over the camera and it'll take your pulse, tell you, tell you what your pulse rate is. That's not all that exciting. I think the EKG is even more exciting. Yeah, that's really cool. There's a few hospitals in the area where we're from that have kind of started a large scale rollout of some of those technologies. Yeah, I mean, there's one where um, we can get remote monitoring of a patient, as I say, a bedridden patient, by putting sensors on them, and then it gets sent wirelessly, but it can be picked up on an iPhone by a physician somewhere else on the net. And uh, so, you know, a lot of these things developing using the network. But to what extent, I mean, are these revolutionary new technologies? I think they're just things that, that learn how to use the network the way it is. I'm not sure where it's going in the future. Yeah, I think that's a political question. Uh, and right now, um, certainly in the United States, um, uh, Political progress is pretty much at a standstill. You know, Congress is deadlocked. Uh, I think the United States is not the only place where that is happening. So will people take action politically to curb or to limit some of these abuses? I don't know. I certainly hope so. Um, I, I can't remember the, who, who was the target, but I imagine there were many targets. Uh, sometime, I think, well, in our past history. Supposedly, our 
spy agencies uh, conspired to get urine samples from dictators or from, from you know, potential adversaries so they could analyze the urine samples and infer what the person's health was and how long this person was likely to live. Okay? That's real. Or at least I, you know, I, I read it and I believe it. Okay? Well, let's say that, that somebody was sending medical information over the network. And let's say that somebody that was sending medical information or somebody whose medical information was being sent was a political leader. And so you wouldn't have to sneak in and get urine samples out of the bathroom. I mean, you could actually get real stuff which is being sent. And uh, to what extent can that be protected? To what extent can a determined hacker hack into medical records and get stuff on, say, the president or the Speaker of the House and so forth? Speaker of the House has been absent for the last three days. Nobody knows where he is. Hey, let's hack into his medical records and find out what's going on. So, um, and that was a hypothetical case, by the way. You got that. <laughs>